Because this is a fun week, too, because we are in our first series of our like, new life at the movies. And so we do this every year. We, we take some movies. I think that this is actually the seventh or eighth year in a row we have been doing like an at-the-movies style of thing. And so maybe you're here and you're kind of like, so what is that all about? Like, why, why preach on a movie? And so let me give you a little bit of like, hey, this is why we do this, okay? Because, because we believe that, that Christ transforms culture. We believe that everything that is true is God's truth, that he owns truth that no one else does. And so in using a movie as an illustration, we believe that we have a unique ability to point out that all truth is God's truth and to have a really just kind of fun illustration that we can carry throughout a, a thought process. And so when we also think that these are events that are easy to bring your friends to, we think that these are e- events that are fun to talk about, and there's something about using things that culture is using that just makes a message stick. And so this is why we, um, why we do some of these, and we're doing the movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which if you haven't seen the movie, it's okay. The clips will explain themselves, but it is a movie where essentially, and this is the first of all the Spider-Man movies, if you've seen any of them, like where someone, in our case, this character, Miles, that he is, he is bit by a radioactive spider, and because of that bite, he lives in a world where there's a Spider-Man, and in that world, because of that bite, he is now Spider-Man. We did an online poll on our um, little event group thing on Facebook, and two-thirds of the people, we said, would you want to be Spider-Man if you lived in that world? Two-thirds of the people said yes. So that just gives you a taste of this church, okay? Like, we are vigilantes. <laughs> like, it, just, it is what two-thirds, one-third are like, nah, I'm good, I'll let someone else do it. And two-thirds are like, yeah, if I could swing from stuff, yeah, let's fight. I mean, just like, whatever. But, I mean, that's it. Like, the movie is about this character, Miles, grasping or grappling with the idea, okay, who I am is not who I was. That something happened to me, this bite of a spider, and, and this bite, it changed my identity. And, and where we are in, in 1 Peter, in this letter that we're studying this fall, is we're studying this letter, and, it's a, and it, we're at this point in the letter where Peter is writing to a group of people who, though they weren't bit by a radioactive spider, they would say, I have encountered Jesus, and what I'm starting to discover is who I am is not who I was. And, and as they've discovered this, here's what they're discovering, like what our character is going to discover, is that there are all kinds of challenges that come when who you are isn't who you were. And so in our first clip, what we're going to see is we're going to see the moment of Miles' transformation. That it's a moment like any other. He's, he's down on a subway doing graffiti art with his uncle. We've all been there. And and something happens to him that changes him forever. Let's watch the clip.
Here's what I think is funny about that, okay? So he got bit by this spider, and the, obviously the way that they did that clip, we knew something was happening. But for him, he just thought it was like a normal spider bite. And then up until this point in the movie, Miles, he's just this normal teenager, that he doesn't get along with his parents, that he goes to school, that he just lives his life, that his only relationship that he enjoys is one with his uncle, who it turns out to be a really horrible person that we'll discover in the movie, that there's nothing really all that exciting or interesting about his identity until he gets bit by the spider. And, and everything changes. And, and the thing with Miles, and the difference between him and our people that we're talking about here in First Peter, is that Miles really didn't play any role in his identity change. Like, he didn't find the spider and have the spider bite him. But for us, and this group of people that Peter is talking to, that this is a group of people whose identity has been transformed because they put their faith in Jesus. That it's this moment for them where they realize, okay, I've heard about this guy, and now I'm going to choose to follow him. And in the life of a human being who follows Jesus, there is nothing more crucial than that moment in their life. And Peter draws attention to that here. Let me read it to you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. So maybe you, you maybe we, this is like the buckle of the Bible bell, and so you've probably heard the phrase, born again. Like you've heard maybe someone talk about that. Maybe people will say, like, I'm born again. But it's one of those phrases that we throw around, but maybe we're not really sure what it means. Well, Peter, what he does here is he helps us see what it means to be born again. Because if you're, if you're born again, then your identity changes. That it's impossible to be born again without experiencing some type of transformation. And, and maybe the question is that as your identity changes in Christ, what exactly are you born into. And this is what Peter points out. So he draws attention to two things that we're born into. The, the first thing we're born into is we're born into a living hope. That when you put your faith in Jesus, your hope changes. And, and here's the thing, that if you were to look at our society, it would be very easy to say that that hopelessness is an epidemic that's plaguing our world. That people throughout, everywhere, that they lack hope. And it's not because they're, putting their, they're not putting their hope in things. It's because they're putting their hope in the wrong things. And, and so what Peter wants us to see is, he says, when your identity changes... You're putting your hope into something that is alive. So what, is, what does it mean? Like, what does a living hope mean? And it means a few things. On the most basic sense, this living hope where our hope is, it means that the source of our hope is not dead. He has risen. So, so our hope is in someone who is alive. But there's also this idea that our hope itself is alive. So, so as you grow in your relationship with God, you become more like him over time. That in the same way that like you are alive and you grow as a person, you also should hope that your relationship with God would grow too. And so what that means for you is that means that where you are today with him hopefully is further along than where you were a year ago today with him. Because if your hope is alive, that means it continues to grow. 
that means it continues to develop. That means you, you constantly are, are being transformed into something new. So, so as you're born again, you're born into this living hope. And if that is your hope, then you're also saying, I, I'm going to hope in something different. And, and Peter draws our attention to this inheritance. That, that when you have a different identity, you're hoping in something that the Bible refers to as heaven. And I think because we call so many things heavenly that aren't heavenly, like ice cream or whatever, like it's good, Andy's is great, but I don't know that it's heavenly. Maybe that key lime pie concrete's pretty good. But, but still, we use it, and so we've kind of cheapened the, the punch of that word. But we have this inheritance where we're placing our hope. That means that, that our hope isn't in the things of this world, which, which if we're lucky will last for 100 years, but rather the source of our living hope is on our inheritance, which will last for billions of years. And I find it really interesting for how, how Peter describes this. Okay, notice, he doesn't have the vocabulary to talk about how great it is. But instead what he does is he draws attention to what it's not. He's like, I can't really describe what it is because it's so great, so I'm just going to help you see what, what it's not. And I'm going to use the world that we live in as an example to help you see what it's not. And so he says, this, this hope, this inheritance that's ours, it's imperishable. You can't break it. It's secure. He says that, that it's undefiled. So we are hoping in something that is pure. That we can't even fathom the stain of sin that is on this world. And what Peter is saying is he's saying our inheritance is at a place where that stain is gone. It is undefiled. It's pure. And it's also unfading. That where we live in a world where beauty fades, where new things become old, that our hope in this inheritance is in something where nothing becomes old, but it's always new. And when that is your hope, it changes you. When that's what you're thinking about, that changes how you live. That as we live in this world where people are putting their hope in all kinds of different things, what Peter is doing here is he's saying, no, you are to tether your heart to heaven. And in, in, in biblical terms, when you see the phrase or the word inheritance, it usually involves two things. It involves a gift and a task. That we have been given an inheritance, but our task, our task is to be found in him. And you could see how thinking like this could really change a person's identity. That if you've, if you've been walking with Jesus and you go back to that, maybe that moment where you put your faith in him or maybe those first couple years where, like, there's something about figuring out this way of life that can be kind of clunky. That it's not always so easy to just, to just shift gears like this in such a dramatic way. And, and, and what I love about this movie is, okay, Miles becomes Spider-Man. But it is not easy for Miles to own this identity that is being Spider-Man. And we really see some of his early struggles in this next clip. I think you'll like it. It's pretty funny.
I mean, this is the clip where you're like, okay, he's who he is isn't who he was, that he has to wrestle with, okay, I, I just ruined this girl's haircut, I, uh, I can walk on walls now, this is, I never could do this before, for whatever reason, I got in that guy's office and took my shirt off, like, I don't get why, they, why he needed to do that, but he did, and I don't know how he got his shoes back either, like, it doesn't answer that question, but still, that, those are the things I wonder, but, but nonetheless, he's, he's Spider-Man. And, and as cool as it is to romanticize what that would be like, like you can fight crime, like you're a hero, you can, to get to that point, it isn't, it isn't easy. That it's something that you, you actually have to really struggle through to get where you want to go. And, and Peter actually talks about this type of thing here. Look at this in verse 6. He says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. What Peter's doing here is he's putting the challenges of our faith into perspective. Yeah, your identity shifts. Challenges come with that. But here's what he wants you to see. He, He wants you to see that it's okay. That he wants you to see that even though there are challenges that come, for the believer, you're able to rejoice in those challenges. Because because challenges take a different perspective when we look at them in light of heaven. That that while they might be challenging, while they might be difficult, and not to, to... to diminish our challenge, but I can say that when we look at them through the lens of eternity, that they're just not as devastating as they could be if your only hope is this world. That if your only hope is this world, the hundred years that you have, if you're lucky, yeah, if something goes wrong, that's horrible. Because you get one shot and then it's over. But if you have an eternity that you're getting ready for, well, then those challenges, they just aren't as, aren't as devastating to you. And, and even, like, I, I love this because if you go back in time to when you first found Jesus, I mean, doesn't this, like, make sense? As you struggle with this new identity, that when everything is new, what you're doing kind of feels weird. I mean, it's like we have this worship night coming up, okay? Think of how weird that would feel if you weren't a Christian. Yeah, we're just going to go and sing for an hour. Where, does, where do you do that? Oh, yeah, we're going to sing to God. Like, we're gonna, some people are going to close their eyes. Some people are going to raise their hands. Like, and then we're going we're gonna to pray. Like, yeah, it's, I know it's like the beginning of the school year, but like, I mean, think of how crazy that sounds. Like, people aren't going to get it. Even, like, even these things that are internal that you have to wrestle with as you walk with God. Like, think of how weird conviction is if you're not a believer. Yeah, I'm an adult. I should be able to do what I want. But there's something inside of me that's telling me this is wrong, and it's from someone who I can't see, but, like, I just know in my heart that it's not Like, it's weird. You have to wrestle with this new identity. I mean, think of the challenge that comes when maybe you spent your whole life saying yes to something that now you know you need to say no to. Or you've said no to something your whole life, and now you're at this place where now you're saying yes. That when you do those types of things, your faith is tested. That you go through a, ch- a trial because who you are isn't who you were. I, I think the, probably the most difficult one that we have to walk through as we grow in our relationship with God is when we have to like, address this fact that, okay, I'm different, 
And because I'm different, people who I love, who I enjoy, are now pushing me to the side And it's okay because this change is something that I wanted for myself and I know it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. So there comes this moment in the life of the Christian, okay? And maybe Miles had an advantage because he's like climbing on walls and he's like doing all this stuff and we're just kind of trusting in what's unseen. But there comes this moment in the life of the believer where you look at what it costs and you think to yourself, Man, dear God, I hope this is true. Because I've bet everything on it. And because for a little while, you're going to experience trials. I mean, we live in a world that's broken. If, you, if, you're, if you're a Christian or not, you're going to experience challenges. But but what we're going to see as we continue to study First Peter is so what we're going to see is that, though, yeah, you live in a broken world that has challenges, there are some challenges that the Christian is actually called to create for themselves. That there are some things that you're going to do that are going to naturally push you to the side, and that's in those moments where you say, gosh, I, I bet the farm on this thing, and I just hope that it pays off. Like, that's Miles' moment. Like, he's there. He's Spider-Man. He's dealing with a challenge. He just ruined a girl. He likes hair. Like, that, that's, a, that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. But then at the end of the movie, after he went through all the testing, all the trials, all the challenges, he has the moment that Spider-Man, where he is Spider-Man, where all the challenge became worth it because in this moment he comes and he saves the day, and we'll see that in this clip that we're ready to show.
Like, that was his moment. Like, up until this point, he'd experienced tests. There were things that happened that even, like, the, right before the clip, he's actually tied up in a chair because all the other Spider-Men, yeah, if you haven't seen the movie, that doesn't make any sense, but just trust me, it does. So all the other Spider-Men had tied him up, and they said, hey, we're going to go ahead and fight this guy on our own because you're just not ready. And then this moment happens, and it just clicks. And his opportunity comes, and he's able to save the day. And, and why are we, why, like, what part of this is cool? It was his ability to overcome the test. That our confidence in Miles isn't because he ruined some girl's hair, because he walked on a wall. Our confidence in him, because we now know that he is Spider-Man, it is all based on his ability to overcome the test when the test came. And so it is true with your faith and your relationship with God. Look at, look at what Peter says here in verse 7. He says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is the same is true for you. I know this to be true, that success reveals what's in our heart. It does. Like, that success is something that, that you'll, you'll discover what is inside of someone based on how they handle it. That's absolutely true. But testing, testing is the fire that reveals what is inside of us. And, and in those moments where you're going to have confidence in what God has done in you, that it's going to probably come out based on how you respond to a test. There, there, there's things like wearing a t-shirt here that says you help people know Jesus better. Like, that's great. You can wear the t-shirt. It's a great t-shirt. But living that way in a world that isn't going to give you a high five, that's going to reveal whether or not you believe that or not. That, that it is easy to have faith when everyone you love is healthy. But in that moment where someone you love gets sick and you don't understand why, that's when, that's when it's going to be revealed what's inside of you. The, the, the testing of your faith, that that it's easy. It's easy to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invest in the kingdom because I've got tons of stuff. But in that moment when you are lacking, that's when it's really hard to say, you know what? God gave it all to me. I'm just going to give it back to him. That there are moments where it comes out. There are moments where what you believe is going to come out, and it's going to come out through a test. That when popular culture is saying one thing and the word of God is saying something else and you have to choose what you're going to follow, that is going to reveal what is inside of you. And in the same way that we had confidence in Miles because of how he was able to handle a fight, your confidence in your relationship with God is going to, it's going to be far greater when you're, able to, when you're able to handle a test. Because God uses those to reveal what's inside of us. But what I love about this is that it, 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 Peter is so heavenward. That so often Peter is turning our attention to heaven. And he says here at the end, he says, that in glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's saying, hey, you're going to go through tests, but the day will come when they're going to be worth it. That when this identity, it's, it's going to pay off. But sometimes, for some of us, the tests that we go through, they're not going to make sense until that day. And I know some of you need to hear that. That you look at situations in your life and you're just like, why in the world? 
to that. And, and, and there's no rhyme or reason. There's no answer. And you're just confused. What Peter wants you to know is, yeah, that is going to happen. But not forever. That the day will come where everything that we have gone through, every test that we have either passed or felt, will make sense. And, and even as we think about this message, it's very much like, yeah, you put your faith in Jesus. Yeah, your identity is found in him. But here's the thing that is only available to us because of the work that he did for you. I want to put up the first few verses here. I just want to draw our attention here to the work of Christ on our behalf. Because I'm not going to pretend like walking with God isn't costly, but let's not pretend that it costs us more than it costs him. Okay, so, so just look at his role in our salvation as we land this morning. Why does he save us? Because of his great mercy. So Jesus, so God, he saved you, not because of your potential, not because he needed another one, Not because of something that you've done in the past that made you worthy. No, he saved you just because of his mercy. And it's so important for us as we walk with God to remind ourselves of time that he actually gets nothing out of having us. That really all we give him is a lot of heartache, but he did it anyways because of his great mercy. That not only that, but the work that was done Yeah, we put our faith, we go through the test, but the first test happened with Jesus. Look at that. He caused us to be born again into the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That we're only able to have a new identity in him because of the work that was done for us on the cross. That he died, not you. That, That he paid the price, not you. That, yeah, you might have to identify with him, and sometimes that might create some th- situations for you that are a little uncomfortable. Know that it wasn't as uncomfortable as the cross would have been for him. That he paid the price for you so that you can. And because he did, because he did, now you have a hope that's secure. That you have this inheritance that is so good. You can't even come up with words for it. But he's saying, the day will come where infinity will continue to go forward and it's going to be better than you could ever imagine, better than anything this world could ever bring. And here's the beautiful thing about this, okay? Look at who is guarding our inheritance. God. Who are being guarded by God's power. That in a world that doesn't have hope, our hope is secure because it's being guarded by the one who made it all. Yeah. And that is worth an identity that creates challenges. That is worth some awkward situations because the day will come where it'll pay off. And that is why we tether our hearts to heaven where our hope is secure. Let's pray. Thank you for watching our services. If you have questions or you would like more information, you can visit us online at nlspringfield.com. We'd also love to have you join us at one of our Sunday morning services. We have programs at 9.30 and 11 for adults, students, and kids. We hope to see you there.